Hi everyone and welcome back to NGIV Preparation. So in Instagram, a lot of you guys suggested that I do a video on the Geography IA and how you can get a 7 on that. So I'm going to start off by mentioning the biggest mistake that students make when writing their IA that limits their mark. Your IA is supposed to be analytical. It's supposed to be based on data processing, on data analysis, and that is where you get the most marks. Your IA isn't supposed to be descriptive. It isn't supposed to be mostly about geographic theory. It should be you proving that you can use geographic theory and data analysis to support an argument. What often happens is that students feel the need to spend 500, 600, even 700 words in the very first introduction. You will not get marks on that. So if we look at this table, it breaks down the marks that you get for us. So your suggested word limit for the fieldwork question in the geographic context is three marks. So basically one mark per 100 words. Why would you spend 800, 900 words talking about something that you can't get marks on because it's just not in the rubric? And then for the methods of investigation, you get three more marks. So that's 300 um, words. But of course, you can always write this in a bit less if you know for sure that you're meeting those three marks, which I'll teach you how to make sure that you do. And then for the quality and treatment of information collected in written analysis, that's six marks. And then for the written analysis, that's eight marks. So that's a whopping 14 marks, almost half of the IA. If you were to do nothing else and just analyze the data that you collected and treat it properly, as in with visual graphs and charts and such, you would still get 14 out of 25 marks. That is where you should be placing most of your word count. And in fact, the IB Geography Internal Assess Assessment Guide does say that the word limit for this should be over a thousand words. And then your conclusion, you only get two marks. So your conclusion should really be 200 words, two points, that's it. And then your evaluation, three marks, 300 words. So again, throughout this video and throughout the writing of your IA, keep in mind that you are going to be graded on analysis of data and information, not really on much else. But of course, we want to get 25 marks out of 25 marks. So I'm going to divide this into the different sections and going to be teaching you how you can get the full marks on each section. So the first one is criterion A, field work question and geographic context. So to get three marks, your field work question has to be narrow and needs to mention a specific scale, a specific area, and needs to clearly require the collection of primary data in order to answer. If your field work question is something like what is the average velocity of this particular river that's too narrow and you're not going to have space to really gather as much primary data and to interpret it enough to get the marks that you want a good field work question would be something like to what extent does the change in drainage basin characteristics within the river Ewini in romania correspond to the broadshaw model it does imply the need for some sort of primary data gathering and even includes geographic theory, the Broadshaw model, which relates to drainage basins. So clearly there, your field work question mentions a specific place. So even in that field work question, it immediately becomes clear how you'll be connecting that geographic theory and the link to the syllabus as well. The next section is geographic context. The geographical context must include why the field work investigation was carried out. So why is it significant? Why it was carried out in that specific area? So it can be something like this river was in close proximity to our school or because of safety conditions, this was the best tributary to analyze. Now, the third mark partially comes from the locational map and your locational map should clearly have some sort of symbol indicating where the different sites of the investigation were located. So oftentimes, for instance, if field work is conducted on a beach, you will have 10 sites on a beach and you want to show that on the map. And you should always try to include a sketch version of the map as well. To get all three marks, you also need to make a student prediction about the field work question. So if the field work question is, for instance, whether the Goa beaches were negatively affected environmentally by tourism, a student prediction could be that the Goa beaches will have signs of worse environmental degradation than other beaches, and your justification has to be connected to geographical theory. So for each hypothesis, make sure to justify that. Um, and in this case, that could be talking about ecological care and capacity under the tourism unit. You also want to make sure that your hypotheses are not too complex and not too difficult to prove with the data that you've gathered, but they should not be too simple that it limits your ability to analyze. And the last part of this criterion, the link to the syllabus, it can literally take you a sentence, but you just have to clearly say why the fieldwork question is relevant 
to geography. So if we were talking about river characteristics, then we would just say that it's relevant to the freshwater topic, specifically drainage basin and flooding. And if your field or question for some reason combines two topics, it is fine to link it to the syllabus twice. Here's a checklist brief summary of everything that we've covered so that you can get three out of three marks. The next criterion is methods of investigation and what students often miss marks on is justifying their methodology. So the first step is to describe the method. So you wanna list the equipment needed and how you gather data for each of the primary data that you will be covering in your IA, but you also have to justify. So why was specific equipment used? Is this the most accurate equipment to use? Was it just the equipment that was available? You also want to reference at least once the sample methodology. So like I said before, oftentimes your teacher will divide your location into different sites. How were these sites divided? There are three sampling methods, stratified, random, and systematic. I will leave a link to a full student guide for the IA. This describes there what the sampling methods are. And of course, to minimize the word count that you're wasting on your methodology, I would also include diagrams with annotations just to make it clearer as well. And the last thing I would say is please make sure that all of your primary data is explained in the methodology or you can lose marks. So again, here's another checklist to make sure. Okay, now we're going to start with the more difficult stuff, the thing that is really going to determine whether you get a 7 or not in your IA, and this is the treatment of data. Now, on the rubric, it says that the information collected is directly relevant to the fieldwork question and is sufficient in quality and quantity to allow for in-depth analysis. The most appropriate techniques have been used effectively. So the keywords here are in-depth analysis and relevant. So the first tip that I have for you is to make sure that all your data gathered is relevant to the fieldwork question is to divide your IA according to the hypothesis. So for instance, first hypothesis that environmental degradation follows the Butler model. Okay, then all of your primary data goes under this hypothesis. You give a brief overview of the data gathered, what the trends are, maybe you include an annotated diagram of the sites, and then you visually represent your data. So I'll go over in a bit the different charts, the different visual representation of data that you can use, and under this visual representation is where you write your written analysis, but you also want to reference the specific visual data. So mentioning the trends that there are, the anomalies, even bringing up specific data points. You will also be using statistical techniques, which I'll go over as well, but the main thing for your analysis is to connect it to the geographic theory. So use the geographic theory that you know you can reference back to the geo syllabus to explain why the data gathered is such. So for instance, if we were doing a drainage basin IA and we saw that further downstream of the river, we saw greater processes of erosion. Explain that with the geographical theory and end each section with a clear answer to the hypothesis. So if in section one we find that all my data supports the hypothesis, then end with a sentence saying, therefore the collection of primary data, data and geographical theory indicates the affirmation of the hypothesis. My next tip is to use as many different types of charts as possible, so bar charts, radar charts, pie charts, line graphs, but make sure that they're applicable, that they're relevant. So if you're going to use a line graph, it doesn't really make sense unless you clearly have an independent and dependent variable and you're trying to find a correlation between the two. My next tip is also to use at least once a hand-drawn graph, as again, this could be good for personal engagement, but just make sure that it is clear. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can't just put in charts randomly into your IA, you have to integrate them, by which I mean that you have to clearly address them with words before putting them in or after putting them in. You also want to label them properly, so figure one, figure two, figure three, um, so if you have a line graph, for instance, it should be line of best fit demonstrating the correlation between the independent and the dependent variable, whatever they are. And of course, related to this is criterion D, the written analysis in which you have to make sure that you're using your data to see whether your hypothesis can be supported or not. Do make sure to address anomalies. Students often think that they will get lower grades if they don't address some incongruities in their data. You have to because it allows you to analyze whether it was caused by a methodological error, whether it was something in your methodology that caused this anomaly, or if there's some other factor that's affecting your dependent variable or it allows you to use geographic theory as to, as to why this might be an exception. Another huge tip that won't take much of your time is to study before writing your IA. Study the unit that your IA is based on so you make sure that your ex explanations and your vocabulary is right. You want to use as many key terms from geography as possible. So for the tourism unit, things like ecological carrying capacity, touristic hotspots, sphere of influence, tourism life cycle, all of these concepts and vocabulary will show the examiner that you have knowledge. 
my next tip is like I mentioned before you want to use a variety of presentation techniques but you also want to justify them briefly if you can but the biggest tip here is the use of statistical analysis. It doesn't have to be complex statistical analysis. It can just be making a line of best fit, looking at the correlation coefficient, looking at the slope of the equation of the line of best fit. So if it's a positive slope to say that, oh, this shows a positive correlation over it's a negative slope, a inverse relationship or a negative correlation. And you can argue that if the correlation coefficient is very weak, then maybe the correlation isn't very strong. I would also advise that you use standard deviation and error bars to show how much it deviates from the mean. Maybe use mean squared error to see the average error between the line of best fit and the and the data points. You can also use simple statistical techniques such as mode, median, mean, or even interquartile ranges. But the whole idea is that you're using statistical techniques to be able to support your argument that the data either supports or is neglecting the hypothesis. So for instance, using standard deviation as supporting evidence that maybe your data was not reliable enough in order to form a strong answer to the field or question. Okay, and then for your conclusion, you can only get two marks for your conclusion, so the main things you just want to cover is that you want to summarize how each of your hypothesis was addressed by the data, and you want to have a final statement as an answer to the field or question. You want to give a concrete conclusion as to what your data says about the field or question. A little tip that I have is to actually divide your conclusion. So if you have three hypotheses to have, you know, your conclusion and then hypothesis one, the conclusion for that for the hypothesis one, hypothesis two, conclusion for that hypothesis and so forth. And then the last sentence being the answer to the field or question so that the examiner knows for sure that you answered each of the hypotheses. And now we're on to the last criterion, the criterion F evaluation. The main thing with the evaluation is that you want to explain why this is an error. So the structure of your evaluation is to propose where an error took place and then to suggest an improvement. But you have to explain why this is an error, how this could have affected your data, and explain what caused this error. So was it a systematic error, so caused by the methodology, or was it a random error that it just happened randomly? And another key part is to propose an improvement. Students often just state the error and then not really give an improvement or give an improvement that it's unrealistic or not very specific. You want to clearly say to fix this error next time I want to use this type of equipment or do this many trials, this many um, sample locations instead. Now the last part that many students forget to do is to add an extension at the end of your evaluation. You want to say something about how you would change the exploration if you had the opportunity to do it again. You can even change the field or question or propose a different field or question that now you are intrigued to analyze after completing this exploration and this again shows personal engagement. Okay, so now we've gone through each and every one of the 25 marks that you need to meet on your GOIA to get an 100%. I'll be putting in the description the link to a full study guide for the GOIA and the rubric so that you can clearly check off all the marks. And please subscribe to keep getting updates on how you can improve your IB grades.